I did turn the microphone on. I was uh, waiting for the sound engineer in the back to adjust the knob. I think it's done so. Um, let's see. Uh, my name is Keith Packard. Um, this is research work that I did while uh, I worked at the former Cambridge Research Lab, um, uh, building very tiny devices. Uh, we built a bunch of tiny devices, and I'll show you some pictures of the, of the tiniest of the devices. Um, some of the devices were so small that we didn't, couldn't even manage to fit this little window system in, and they had even more primitive graphics. This uh, particular talk is full about a uh, new window system that I built called Twin. I'm sure we'll be replacing the X window system on your desktops in the next couple of months as you all upgrade all your applications and downgrade your memory requirements. Uh, there'll be a little easier. Evil plan. Yeah, right. By the way, we're going to throw away X and replace it with twin. That doesn't seem like anything. Uh, so what are we trying to do? Uh, what research are we doing at CRL? Uh, what research were we doing at the former CRL? Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, building tiny little devices. Uh, mostly building tiny little, little devices that are supposed to stay on for a long time and do relatively simplistic things. If you saw Jim's presentation um, uh, last hour, uh, you'll note that he talked a lot about Zigbee radios and battery operated devices and that kind of thing. Well, one of the problem, one of the challenges of radios and batteries and, and screens is that batteries never last long enough. Uh, the particular device you're looking at here is not, does not, I'm, I'm sorry, the picture doesn't match the description, although we have another thing that goes in the same package that does. I have a picture of that. This particular device is designed to last for three weeks with the display on. Not with the display off, not with the machine idle. On three weeks, uh, rechargeable batteries. Uh, how do you do that? Well, first of all, this particular device didn't really have an operating system. It had a tiny little, uh, tiny little, basically a pick and a little uh, um, uh, monochrome uh, screen. But the device that I was uh, targeting this particular research at actually had a significantly more powerful CPU, a 200 megahertz CPU with uh, 384K of RAM and 8 megahertz flash inside the chip. So the machine could actually run without wobbling any external wires and do relatively uh, useful work um, uh, for a long period of time. Uh, because in this kind of environment, it's all about how, many, how much capacitance you're driving. And every external connection from your CPU is a lot of capacitance. So any work you can do on the chip is, uh, is pretty cheap. And any work you do off the chip is really expensive. Um, so, well, why don't we just use X in this environment? We've obviously embedded X in similar devices in the past. Uh, one of the first devices that, we, that I embedded X in, um, uh, one of the first tiny devices, was, was the Compact ITSI research prototype uh, that, that was built at the, Western, the former Western Research Laboratory. <laughs> They're dropping like flies. <coughs> this particular device said it had a whop, the whopping sum of 16 megabytes of memory, which in 1997, 1998, Seven. When it was designed, 16 megabytes of memory in your hand was pretty damn impressive. Uh, four megabytes of flash memory. Flash memory at the time was insanely expensive. Uh, 200 megahertz CPU and a giant 200 by 320 LCD. This was an impressive device at the time. Uh, preceded the uh, preceded the uh, um, similar uh, WinCE based devices by quite a long time. Um, uh, this particular device uh, didn't really precede the IPAC device in any technological way, but certainly informed a lot of the form factor and a lot of the power management research. The, a lot of power management research was done on this platform. Uh, this particular device on, rechar on rechargeable batteries could last for a day with occasional use. You couldn't have it on the whole time. Um, so we're getting, you know, we're getting a long ways from my three weeks with the display on all the time uh, back to a day. So this is why we really can't run X. X does take too much memory. It does take too much CPU power, and it's not designed for low battery, uh, low power environment uh, with very limited memory. In particular, that 16 megabytes of RAM is very expensive to keep refreshed. Uh, the device we're targeting has 384 kilobytes of RAM, uh, a lot less uh, capacity, and a lot less uh, power. 
One of the assumptions here is because driving external wires is very expensive, you don't want to talk to the frame buffer very often. You want to talk to the frame buffer as little as you can, and in fact, you want to be able to scale the amount of uh, frame, the, the rate of frame buffer refreshes based upon the, your perceived level of intention uh, by the user. So if the user is not attending to the device, you don't want to update the screen very often. Because I can run the applications and have them drawing and rendering all kinds of stuff inside the memory in the, in the tiny little device, but I can't hit the external frame buffer without wasting a huge number of joules. Oh, okay, a huge number of microjoules. <laughs> uh, the other thing, the other assumption about Twin is that the graphics, this graphics display doesn't do anything. It's completely done. Uh, that's an architectural, uh, uh, something that informed the architecture of the system uh, at a much more, a much deeper level than it does in X, for instance, where the assumption is that it can be accelerated or it cannot. But it uh, definitely changed how I thought about the architecture of the system. And the other one was that the CPU would be a reasonable performance, so I could actually do some interesting graphics. Um, it's really hard to get an embedded microprocessor now that doesn't have reasonable CPU performance. So what we're looking at here is a 200 megahertz CPU, um, and you can scale the power back if you need to. Uh, scale, scale the clock down if you need to. But I've got a lot of CPU power. No floating point, of course. Well, you know, floating points for rich people. So what did I want to do? What did I want to build? I gave myself a budget of 100k of text space. Now remember that this device has four megabytes of flash and only 384k of data. Well, fortunately, we can execute out of flash. Otherwise, it would never build anything useful. Um, I wanted basically an entire X Cairo GTK stack. I wanted a window system. I wanted a, a uh, PostScript-like rendering library. And I wanted a GTK-like uh, toolkit. And I was going to do that all in 100 kilobytes of text. Uh, in an X environment, you know, you're talking uh, 100 kilobytes for the line drawing code. Uh, the other key, in, in, the other key requirement here is uh, what we want to display on these tiny little displays is a lot of text, um, and we, so we need to be able to uh, kern the text. We want to make it proportional. I have to be able to change the sizes. I want different fonts. You know, I want all those nice things, but I don't have any space for all this code. So uh, the text is a very interesting piece. Uh, so this isn't features that are limiting to the system. Uh, in order to save a bunch of space, I wanted to limit the set of features that I offered. Uh, in the environment. Uh, one of the first things I, I decided that I probably didn't need was an external window manager. The external window manager in X provides you a huge amount of uh, security and performance uh, guarantees. Uh, you don't have to trust the application to iconify itself when it's, when it's uh, pegging the CPU. Um, and so you have this ability to decouple the window manager from the application. In this environment, it's like, well, you know, we're going to trust the applications to be reasonably well written. Um, I also took the uh, Cairo rendering model, which is very huge and takes a lot of code to implement. I kind of diked out all the stuff that wasn't, wasn't used very often. So if it wasn't absolutely essential, it didn't go in. This is kind of the fly approach to Windows system techniques. It doesn't need a lot of brains. It's got 12 neurons or something. That's all it's got. And I limited the image formats. You know, X has, you know, 8-bit, 12-bit, 37-bit, whatever. No, we have two image formats. And by, by reducing this, the length of each axis of the combinatorial explosion, I'm able to dramatically reduce the amount of rendering code I needed. And in fact, I was able to reduce it enough that I just generate every, every possible rendering operation in open code. And that means that there aren't any slow paths because everything's just, you know, there's no general code. It's, everything's, every special case has been implemented. Um, so what did I want to do about windowing? Well, you know, you don't think about uh, you don't think about a composite-based window system as a viable alternative in this environment. But it turns out that because I wanted to reduce the amount of communication with the external frame buffer, because that's where you have to wobble those wires and burn those jewels, charging those capacitive loads, it turns out that by keeping all the window contents in my RAM inside the, inside the chip, I can get a composited window system for free and save a bunch of power. So windows are just fix maps. You draw, into the, uh, draw window contents into a fix maps, um, and then they're composited as they're updated on the screen. And so the compositing stage is the only place where the external frame buffer is touched. You do all compositing, both composited data up to the screen. I'll show you how that works in a minute. And so I have RGB and ARGB windows. Cool, huh? All of a sudden you've got translucent clocks, and you've got, you know, flying, sharp, shiny stuff all over the screen in no memory. The other tremendous advantage is because is uh, by asserting that windowing is composited like this, the applications don't have to handle damage at all, right? Their contents are always fully retained. 
So the complexity application drops off dramatically. They know they, when they draw, the stuff appears. When resize happens, they have to repaint. That's not a big deal. But when they draw, they don't have to deal with damage issues. And that actually saves a bunch of application code. So I'm saving code in the application by spending a bit of code in the window system. Uh, unlike X, I don't have an external compositing manager, so I can't have wobbly windows or anything like that. There's a static compositing algorithm. You know, it just paints the windows in the order they appear. And of course, it's a 2D compositing system. It doesn't, you can't paint the windows on the side of a cube and rotate the cube on your telephone. Very, very, very basic. Okay, for screen updating, one of the goals that I had was I want it fully double buffered. I didn't want any application clicker at all. In X, we fight this constantly, right? You get applications that paint partially, and then a vertical retrace comes along, and you see crap on your screen. That's not acceptable, especially in a tiny little screen where you're trying to get as much information and content as possible. The last thing you want to do is distract the user with a bunch of uh, flashing stuff. But I don't have any memory. Remember? How much memory do I have? 384 kilobytes. So I don't want an extra full size off-screen buffer, even transiently. That's not acceptable. So what I do is I actually do it a line at a time. So I allocate a single scan line size, frame buffer size scan line in memory, and I walk the window hierarchy, painting across the scan line, uh, uh, compositing all the windows into the single scan line, and then I push the scan line out, the, out the, uh, the, the thin pipe to the actual frame buffer. And this means if I get a fully double buffered screen with no back buffer. Isn't that cool? Okay, there we go. The other thing I wanted to do, yeah? What's the trade off there? A lot more CPU time? Um, surprisingly, no, because I only have 240 scan lines. I only have to walk the window hierarchy 240 times as I'm walking across the scan lines. And the, uh, the, so, yeah, there is a performance trade off, obviously. I'm doing a bunch of additional work per scan line. Right. Yeah. I don't have very many scan lines, I don't have very many windows, and I've got a really fast CPU. So I'm burning some CPU cycles to save a ton of memory. We used to do that in the old days, you know. <laughs> yeah? Can you Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the rendering operations compute a bounding box of the damage that they caused, and the bound that bounding box is, is trickled all the way up the hierarchy. So I actually have a bounding box in the area of the screen need that needs updating. And I don't update unless the, the unless there's a, a non-empty bounding box. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Do you chase the vertical retrace? No, I do not. I don't chase the vertical retrace. Right, right. So that would be a nice thing to add in this particular device. Ha! I don't know what the vertical retrace is. Yeah, yeah I didn't. I, yeah, that that would be easy to add, right? Because I'm doing it well, I scan line at a time. So I just need to start when the vertical retrace is at the top and, and keep ahead of it. It's obviously fast enough. So the other thing I wanted to do with double buffering, of course, is I wanted to get rid of the flicker, the intermediate application contents. But I didn't want back buffers for every application. Right? Again, that costs memory. Um, so instead what I do is I let an application disable updates. So the screen doesn't update while an application says, oh, don't update right now. So every application has a little disable count. So every time before they start updating their, their window, they say, disable, draw, 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 enable. So you bump the disable count, the screen freezes, and you get down to the bottom, you enable, and the screen releases. Every window can be disabled, and the entire screen then tracks how many windows have been enabled and disabled. So as a window transitions from, uh, uh, from, dis from enabled to disabled, it, it cranks the screen count as well. So the entire screen freezes while any application draws. Would you do this in a desktop environment? Probably not. But again, I'm talking about a tiny little screen Interesting, uh, different compromises for different environments. So all the scan line update algorithm waits for the global screen uh, count to go to zero, or for and, and or for a timeout. So it's actually a so you can actually build in some latency to accumulate multiple multiple updates. Obviously, this you know massive DOS potential. You have one application that disables itself and then the screen never updates. So we're, again, we're assuming the applications are nice and well written and perfect and bug free and never crash. That's easy, right? Okay, so what rendering model do I want for my tiny little window system? Well, we used to do bitlet in these tiny little window systems with XOR mode and you know resin ham lines and all that kind of stuff. It's like, whoa, way past A. Nobody wants to draw like that anymore. Can I build a modern rendering system in very little memory? That was the question. Uh, so obviously the system looks a lot like Cairo, 
in the bottom, end, bottom end, and this is the rendering model, it looks very much like the render extension. You know, it's kind of a theme going on, I suppose. Um, <coughs> Porter Def compositing, usual image operators, Plan 9 style compositing function. We've seen it all before. Uh, the only limitation here is that there's only two possible operators. In render, we have 16 or something. And again, that's one of these combinatorial axes and different operators that you have. So I only support two of them. Uh, Plan 9 only supported one. It only supported over. But unfortunately, they discovered that to scroll images on the screen or to erase things on the screen, you kind of needed another one. So I, added, I just added the other one in here. They have a whole bunch of kludges in their window system to handle erasing the screen, which isn't supported by this operator. Um, OK. So what kind of geometry did I add to this? Well, obviously, it looks a lot like Hira. What did PostScript like? Has we do lines and uh, cubic splines, um, uh, and then you got this, and so you've got this giant path, and then you scan, convert it to a polygon, and then you fill the polygon. Pretty simple. Um, not only that, but in this integer-only system, I've added full affine transformations. So you have little matrices, so all of your coordinates go through a matrix, uh, go through an affine transformation, <coughs> so you can scale and rotate and do all those kinds of cool things. Um, it's kind of interesting, the amount of stuff you can eliminate from a typical 2D graphic system by adding paths and affine transforms. It covers all the stuff you ever want to draw in a very small amount of code. So this is actually a tremendous savings of space. By adding affine transforms and by adding paths, that's all I really need, which is kind of cool. Uh, OK, now, so I've got this 32-bit processor. Uh, it has no floating point. Uh, emulating floating point consumes a huge number of joules. But I've got an affine transformation. What the heck do I do? And how do I, how do I you know, s resolve this fundamental conflict between the post normal PostScript rendering model and the fact that I have no FPU? Well, you pick fixed point, and you pick uh, resolution, and hope kind of works out. Um, I'll, I don't think I actually have a slide on why I picked a different device space. User space is in 16.16 .16 fix. It gives me a relatively wide dynamic range. Um, you can actually do quite a bit of scaling before you start noticing uh, obvious, obvious artifacts. Device space, on the other hand, is limited to 16 bits. The reason you want to limit device space to 16 bits is because the fundamental uh, uh, Bresenham algorithm uh, for walking edges uh, requires twice the resolution of your coordinate space uh, to, do some, to, to do the setup computation. And so instead of emulating 64-bit math just so that I could have a wider device space, I said, whoa, let's just see what we can do with a 16-bit coordinate space. So you would think that four bits of subpixel position would be not enough, because after all, your input space has 16 bits of subpixel position. But the input space is pre-affine transform. So you run it through the affine transform, and it dumps out in this 12.4 fixed format, and doesn't ever get transformed again. So one of the limitations here is that once you transform from uh, user space to device space, you can never get back without losing most of your precision. Uh, and so yes, devices in this window system are limited to uh, 4096 pixels square. Uh, it's rough, but you know I had to make some compromises. I'm hoping to get a telephone with a screen that has 16 million pixels. <laughs> Wouldn't that just rock? It's like, wow, 16 megapixel display. Aren't those skin tones cool? <laughs> OK. So now we've got the basic geometry. Um, what do we do about lines um, to stroke them? Well, fortunately, haha, I've been doing research in stroking lines. And we have a lovely algorithm in Cairo that does uh, linear time uh, constant uh, linear time uh, stroking for uh, based on the path length and the complexity of the pen. Um, in Cairo, however, Cairo really does expose a very much a postscript model. It has a stroke operation. You actually call the system to stroke a line. Ha oh, ha, that's too complicated for my little window system. Instead, I have an operation that takes a path, this path you constructed, and it takes a pen object, which I represent as a path as well, and it does this convolution operation between them. I didn't actually build a slide on this. I don't know if it's uh, because I've presented it so many times before. Uh, I probably 
function of. It's kind of cool. So you get this convolution, and just, it's just another path. And then you can do whatever you want with it. And in fact, one of the cool things you could do is you can get an outline tracing of your line segment now by just taking another pin, taking your con your, the output of this convolution operation, and convolving again. Now I have a tracing of the outline of my line. So if I have this line segment, that I, this path that I've just drawn as a line, I can actually get the outline of that line. Wash, rinse, and repeat. You can get as many outlines as you want. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. One of the other things that I did is in a normal PostScript system, one of the most expensive parts of line drawing turns out not to be drawing lines, but all the little jujas you want to stick on the ends of them, the round caps or the miter caps, or the bevel joints, whatever you want to do. Um, the round caps are really simple. I've got a circular pen. So for the round cap, all you have to do is kind of follow the pen around the corner and you generate, you uh, draw a round cap really quickly. It turns out the only hard ones are projecting caps, where you want to go out and make a little square in the end of your line. Those, have, those turn out to be really hard. And in fact, in Cairo, it's got, whoa, miles of trig code to compute where that little corner needs to go. It's got square roots and divides, and man, the mathematics is immensely complicated. I do mine with two ads. <laughs> the results are not nearly as pretty. Uh, but you do get the basic result. I initially, in fact, the initial design for the system included no, uh, nothing other than round caps and round joints. That, that's trivial. That's what falls out of the algorithm. And I decided, oh, you know, that's really a little too cheesy, especially when you're drawing text. You might sometimes want square caps. So I looked into it to find, try to figure out if I could do the other ones cheaply. It turned out, 10 or 20 lines of code later, we have all the cap styles. That was kind of fun. Okay, now. In these little screens, the most important data in the 2D window system is not the pictures. The most important data in the 2D window system is the text. Um, in this other device that I showed you, this little uh, clipboard that I could really call it, it was a, it was a black and white screen. Um, and it's a low resolution, a tiny little screen. Uh, we were uh, using these devices in a hospital in Western Massachusetts, um, a hospital um, where the, the patient population was largely Hispanic which you wouldn't think would be relevant until you discover that Hispanic names are often really long. <laughs> you know, they have three or, four mid, uh, three or four middle names and a long surname and a long, a long uh, first name. And you glue all that together and you've got like 90 characters of text to put in 300 pixels. It's like, what the heck do you do? Um, so what they did, what we did for that particular device is we built some handmade bitmap fonts and built kerning tables and got ligatures working, we crammed all this stuff together. Uh, well, all with custom bitmaps. The problem, of course, bitmaps are ugly, and they don't scale at all. So when you want to display a title, you have to have huh, another bitmap. When you want to display italics, you have to have another bitmap. Um, so bitmaps really aren't working in this environment, because I can't get enough variation, of, I can't get enough typog typographical variation in a little bit of memory. Each bitmap face was like 8 or 10 kilobytes. If you look at the size of a, and this is just for ASCII, if you want to start actually using you know, uh, Unicode, you're, 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 uh, uh, the size is just going to explode. Um, the problem with using outlines is the usual outline formats for type 1 or 2 type fonts, the, the outlines are very verbose. I mean, if you look at the text here, it's, it's got a huge number of splines describing each curve, elegant curves with lovely splines. The stroke went very smoothly around the curves. It's got a huge amount of data for that. The other problem is, is that in order to display them nicely on a bitmap screen, you have to hint them. The hints are even bigger. There's these huge instruction tables you have to wander through with a little interpreter that goes over this instruction language and executes all kinds of stuff. And it does huge amounts of ugly mathematics, including <gasps> divide, <laughs> which you don't want to do in this process, by the way. Um, so they're really big. Each outline font is 30 or 40 kilobytes. And you need another one for italic, and another one for bold, and another one for bold italic. And they're really slow because of all this code you have to execute. So where do you go? You can't do bitmaps, you can't do outlines. Well, we can use strokes. How many of you have ever used a stroke font? None of you. OK, let me show you how they, the cool thing about stroke fonts is they're really small. In fact, the, one of the first stroke fonts that I'm going to show you here was designed back in the 1960s. Each glyph is like 20 bytes for an entire glyph. That's really cool. The other nice thing is because I have this really fast stroking algorithm, ha, I can draw really fast. It's like emulating the old pen plotter right there in my display. 
And the cool thing is I can scale it. So all of a sudden, I don't need multiple bitmaps for different sizes. And the other thing I can do with strokes is I can run them through my FI transformation engine and tilt them over so I can oblique them. I can change the line width on the stroke and make them bold. Mm -hmm. So with a tiny amount of data, I can get all the stroke variation, the size variation, the style variation, the weight variation, everything that I want um, in a tiny amount of memory. So uh, where did I find some lovely stroke fonts? Well, back in the mid-1960s, um, people were trying to draw, um, trying to draw diagrams on, uh, on old pen fonts. Um, and they wanted to, you know, label the stuff on their pen, with their pen potter. So this, uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Hershey, who worked at the U.S. National Bureau of Standards, put together a huge collection of glyphs uh, based on, in, uh, on, purely on stroke. They're designed for pen plotters, and the glyphs are formed from line segments. And the cool thing is this font, this particular face that I use doesn't show it, but he's got, like, fonts that have various... Uh, varying line width, and he does that by lining up little line segments next to each other. And then a pen plotter, the ink kind of bleeds over and fills in the area. Oh man, it was cool. Back in the day, that was that was the bomb. You were just rocking when you had gothic text on your pen plotter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't remind me of this. But inside the Hershey fonts, I actually found a reasonable set of relatively simple uh, sans serif fonts that looked like they'd be a good target for the application. And here they are. Uh, if you look closely, I don't know if you can actually see them, but these are obviously segmented. Can you see the obvious segments in? I try to make them as big as I could. Um, so, well, that's one problem right there. Right? Even at this relatively small size, you can see that they're obviously not continuous glyphs. So I didn't really, I didn't really like that. The other thing is, is that representing this O as a sequence of short line segments takes up a, quite a bit of memory, actually, because each of those little segments takes two points. Um, the glyphs are represented with one byte per uh, coordinate, so each point takes two bytes. So if you have like 50 points around the circle, that's like 100 bytes. That's outrageous. I can't do that. I got memory to save. So what I did is because I can draw cubic Bezier splines, and I've got tons of CPU, ha, I just fitted the curved portions with splines and extended, uh, actually I had to draw some new glyphs to extend all, to cover all of ASCII. That's the weird thing. And this is 1965. This is pre-ASCII. <laughs> so there were actually glyphs in the, there were actually, I couldn't find in the entire set, the entire, all of at the ASCII characters. So I had to actually draw my own glyphs for part of it. But so what I did is I actually fitted the, fitted this, you can see this ampersand, the top of it's nice and chunky. And when you, you fit it with splines, and in fact this thing is represented with, let's see, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight splines to represent that glyph. Each spline takes six bytes. That's 48 bytes for that ampersand. And over here, it's represented with like 30 line segments. 60 bytes. So I saved, I don't know, 20% or something of space. But it looks better. Which, of course, is critical. Um, the other problem with these pen plotters, well, the other advantage of pen plotters is they have basically infinite resolution, right? Whatever the addressable resolution is, you could, and they were really high, you could, the, the pen would go right there and draw you know, a nice, smooth, non-jaggy line uh, at that position. On the bitmap screen, no such luck. I've got very few pixels. The technique that we use in outline fonts is to hit the fonts. And so I said, well, can I actually you know, snap stuff around so that it actually does a reasonable job? Can I automate this process? How much data is it going to take? So I figured out how to hint these stroke glyphs. And the way that you hint the glyphs is you just snap, uh, you locate all of the horizontal and vertical um, elements of the glyph. And by horizontal, you also mean the, the uh, spline, uh, the, where the splines are hint, the horizontal and vertical. And you, I don't know if you can see these, uh, the solid lines in this figure, printed better in the, in the proceedings. Uh, but you'll actually note the horizontal and vertical lines here. So you mark all of those, you figure out where all of them are, and then you snap those line segments to the integer grid, right? So I'm, I'm uh, actually the half integer grid so that the pixels line up on the integers, you know, fill, fill the squares nicely. So you snap those so that the, so that the uh, lines involved are right in the middle of the pixels, so you get full pixels. Over here, this line would draw a little bit of gray over here, a little bit of gray over here, look terribly fuzzy. Over here, it's going to be a nice black line. 
And down here, it's going to sit nicely on the baseline and line up with all the other glyphs, and it's going to get nicely snapped all the way around. And so you see the glyph, it looks similar, but it's, you know, a little different, a little thicker now because it's exactly a pixel wide instead of being three quarters of a pixel wide. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to draw much better on the screen. I'll, I'll show you again. I've got some examples of that. And again, we can do bold, oblique, and bold, oblique just by changing the line width and changing the, and shearing it a bit. Um, okay. I've got this tiny little screen. I've got a tiny little window system now. Now I actually have to build, now I'm kind of done with my part of it, but now I have to actually be able to build applications and demonstrate all this cool stuff to other people. So the rest of this stuff is working, but I don't know what the design should be yet. I'm not, um, the, the input model is probably okay, but this is the whole toolkit stuff. You know, I'll wave my hands off when I show you that part. Oh, it works, but you know, Owen told me it would be hard to write a toolkit. And uh, I believed him, but uh, then I started writing it was harder than I thought. Um, so input model in X, X has an extremely flexible input model. You know, you can do grabs, and you can select what buttons you want to collect and click on. And you get all this kind of stuff. No, no, no. In this system, everything's fixed. Um, events are delivered to the containing window. Containing is defined by uh, non-translucent, non-transparency. So I don't know why I said non-translucent. That's just a mistake. So if if the if the mouse is over a pixel in your window and the pixel is not transparent, then you get that mouse button. Uh, the mouse is grabbed or the button is down. So you click the mouse or the pen or whatever touch screen or whatever you got. You get all the coordinates until you uh, take your finger off the uh, screen or take your mouse, a finger off the mouse button. Um, keyboard focus is only explicit. This keyboard follows pointer. Uh -uh. Oh, the other thing I didn't tell you about the window system is there's only one level. It's not a hierarchical window system. Windows are you only get the only the only the only windows are top level objects, so you can't have windows inside of windows. And so in a keyboard focus, and that's much easier. It's like in the mouse stuff, it's much easier. There's only, the window system only has to do one level of the input, input um, uh, demultiplying, or multiplexing, demultiplexing. Um, so then I got a window system, I could do keyboard and mouse input, I actually built some applications at that level, um, and, got, and so I could test all my rendering code, of course, which is what I was interested in. <coughs> Pretty pictures, those are also the most important part. Um, so then I wanted to build a toolkit, and I looked at how GTK and QT are moving in toolkit design. It used to be in the old battle motif days that every widget or most every widget on the screen was implemented as a separate window system object, a separate window in the window system. Uh, QT and GTK are moving, the, moving in the direction where there are no windows inside the application. All of a sudden, this hierarchical window system we built, they're flattening it entirely. They're using uh, windows occasionally for clipping, but even there, even there, though, they're going away. They're just doing clipping implicitly. The reason for that is twofold. The first one is performance. By getting rid of a bunch of server-side objects, you're actually able to do things faster and with uh, and better. All of a sudden, the uh, updating when you when you move windows around in the X window system, the window motion appears on the screen all uh, right away. So if you relay out your application and it's got a bunch of sub windows, and all those windows are just zipping around, and you're just going, "What the heck's going on?" You don't get that smooth interface that you want. So you get that, this, this perceived performance lag where the application is doing stuff and the user is perceiving the application is not ready for them to interact with instead of a nice uh, synchronous update. So QT and, and uh, GTK are moving to this flattened model. So this hierarchical window system we built in X turns out to probably not be necessary they, uh, at the application level. It's useful at a system level in other ways, but at the application level, we don't need sub windows. So this toolkit. Uh, it's based on the notion that you have a single screen on your, in your window system, which contains many windows, some of which are visible and some of which aren't. Each of the windows here are, of course, just image buffers. And so you can draw, you can create an off-screen image buffer just by creating an image buffer and not putting it on the screen. Um, so we have lots of windows. Each window is represented by a top-level widget, and then each, each of those contains a box, and the boxes contain boxes or widgets. They're pretty simple. So you have a hierarchical toolkit but all the drawing is done in a single window. And so when you relay out stuff, you just relay out the whole box structure and then repaint. And again, because I have the synchronized update stuff, uh, where you can turn off updates for an arbitrary amount of time, uh, all the application resizing just appears completely atomic. You don't see an intermediate state. Um, 
The boxes, the layout geometry that I'm using here is a fixed geometry engine. I don't have multiple layout policies. Um, each box uh, contains a natural size and some stretch and shrink. So you resize the application and the stretch is stretch and the shrink is shrink and the application relays out. Um, one of the reasons that, that works reasonably well is that it's not, the uh, applications are designed to be targeted at a particular device. So we, I don't expect them to actually lay out, relay out very often. I don't even expect resize to happen all that often. Um, right now, in the current system, the event model, I think I'll have to replace this, but uh, in the current model, events are dispatched immediately. There's no queue. So an event comes in from the, from the uh, mouse of the keyboard, and I'm just <coughs> calling down the tree. Um, it dispatches it right down the toolkit stack with function calls. So an event gets dispatched to the screen. The screen says, oh, I need to dispatch it to a window. Let's find out uh, if it's a mouse event. It finds out what window contains the mouse, finds out whether it's transparent. If it's transparent, it drives down, drills down through the window system. Dispatches that event to the window. Then the, the window then dispatches that to the appropriate box. The box dispatches it to the sub-element all the way down to this giant call, uh, call step. Um, that means that each level gets to interact with the event dispatch in any way, any way that it wants, which is kind of cool. So you can do grabs if you want. You can, uh, you, know, you can say, oh, I need the mouse at this level uh, and not at this lower level. So when you click in a window, the window manager or the window manager library routines get to see that mouse click before it's dispatched in the application. So if they want to, they can set the input focus. So all the complexities of replay and all that kind of stuff, that all kind of goes away. Uh, in, the, in the X window system. Layout, boxes in blue. Uh, one of the nice things, of course, is you can actually compute the natural size of an application just by summing up and laying out the application uh, at all of its intermediate sizes. Uh, one of the advantages here, obviously, is when you, when you localize an application or when you change the content of a label, the application can uh, adapt, adapt, uh, adapt to the new text automatically. A lot of systems in this level, like the POMOS in my telephone, all the layout is done with static pixels. You basically place all of the objects on the screen, which means when you put different content in a label or a different, con a different label on a button, huh, your application layout doesn't work anymore because the button overflows. Pretty nasty. Uh, now I have to demo, because everybody has to have a good demo, right? Oh, everybody know what that picture is? Okay, so it's weak. I needed to load both my slide at about two in the morning. So let me show you. Let me show you how, how well the system works. So this is um, the twin window system. This is all the source code for it, and the objects, of course. Um, and it's just now it's doing the scan line at a time stuff, and it's just using put image to put the lines across the X server. So the entire window system is running in a sub-window here. Um, and it's just every update is a bunch of a long sequence of put images. So you can move windows around, obviously. And you can have translucent applications. Note the text here is opaque. I don't know, if you, I don't know how you would tell the text is opaque. Oh, the green doesn't bleed through. Um, you can have shaped windows. I'm just, again, that's just a window where it's alpha is zero in this area. Um, and, and this is the a demonstration of the text. I don't know how well you can see that. This is just the Hershey fonts at a very small size. Um, and it's quite legible. The only really objectionable character in here, it's actually not too objectionable on the screen here. The W on the screen here is, is really dark. And that's just because it's got a lot of lines in it. I could stretch it out and try to make it a little less dense, but it's not too bad. Uh, in this clock here, uh, it's really hard to see. But you know, this clock, the clock hands are just two lines. There's a line here and a line here. Um, they're translucent. But I wanted to make them a little more definite in the clock here. So again, I used the convolution operator to generate this uh, lozenge-shaped hand, which is just a line with round caps. Then I wanted to darken the edges. So I used a smaller pen, like a one pixel wide pen, and reconvolve to generate the outline of the lines. I you note know, the text rotates nicely, and you can oblique it underline it because you have geo the, the metrics of all the characters. Uh, this is the calculator, of course, is really the only um, complete toolkit uh, application. This, this is really written with the toolkit. And I'm sure you're stunned and, and amazed to know that it actually computes numbers in 32-bit 
So if you uh, multiply things too big, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, there you go. Oops. Kind of wrap, wraps around. Uh, this is the this is the uh, the Cairo spline stroking algorithm, and so uh, Carl was showing some fireworks uh, at the desktop developers conference yesterday, uh, and of course because I use the same algorithm that Cairo does, it doesn't have this problem. Now of course this is running on my you know one and point two gigahertz uh, Pentium processor. The question is how well does this run on a little tiny device? And one of the things you have to do is to actually um, one of the one of the tasks I wanted to get done uh, before I got laid off today. Um, was to uh, actually get this running on UC Linux on the Palmas emulator on this on, under this under this environment. It's going to be a, it's going to be kind of a, uh, a steaming amount of work, and the modularization of the X server has kind of put this kind of stuff on on the back burner for now. Oh, here is an example of those of those cool projecting caps. And one of the cool things about the projecting caps, you know, that when I wiggle the line down here, the cap doesn't follow very well. Uh, it kind of snaps around. Uh, that's because this is kind of a cool hack. Again, I told you the projecting caps are a total hack. That's actually got the correct time up here. That's kind of cool. Um, the projecting caps, again, the pins are circular pins. The pen is approximated to within the tolerance. The tolerance in the window system is currently half a pixel, I think. Maybe a quarter of a pixel or something. And the, so the, the circle, the pen is approximated to within a quarter of a pixel. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the points along this pen are within a quarter of a pixel of one another. That just means the line segments that they generate are within a quarter of a pixel of the two circles. They're actually several pixels apart. Um, and the problem is, is the corners of my projecting cap can only lie on the, cor on the coordinates of that circle. Because to get to the corner of the projecting cap, I just go out to the corner that's over here, on the circle, I just put the circular pen right here, and then figure out where the uh, where the nearest corner, uh, where the nearest co uh, point on that pen, the polygon that I use for the, the pen is out here. I use that corner out there for the corner of the uh, projecting cap. So that means when I move this around, those points can only occur on the points that are actually within that circular pen. So you can kind of count how many how many points are on the pen. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, so it looks like there's about 48 points in the circle uh, around at this line. Uh, it's kind of fun to compute how many points are needed to approximate a circle uh, when you have an affine transformation in your way. Uh, we learned the hard way that it was harder than we thought. Um, okay, I, I think that's about the extent of my lovely demo. I don't think there's any more applications having in there. Um, you have questions or comments? Yeah. Um, one, of the things that I, one of the things that I really took to heart in developing this Windows system was that if it looks good, it is good. Um, when we were designing the X Windows system and the render extension and starting our design in Cairo, one of the precepts we took from the X Windows system design was that you needed it to be pixel exact so you could test it and so that it was, you know, demonstrably good by being matching the spec. One of the things that I learned here was that it's far better to be fast enough and look good than to match the spec. Um, and in fact, in the render extension now, I'll, um, in the render extension, I interpret the render extension to not to no longer be a pixel exact specification because of this work. Right? I want you when you're implementing the render extension, I want you to make it fast, and I want you to make it look like <coughs> the render extension is supposed to look. I don't want you to match the pixel exactly. Because matching the pixels exactly means going 100 times slower, or in this in this environment, it's uh, it's more relevant if you're using 100 times as many rules. If that's if that's what it takes to get pixel perfection, I'm really not interested. Uh, so that was one of the things I learned. The other thing I learned was that um, the compositing model really can dramatically reduce the complexity of a lot of the system um, by getting applications out of the, out of the business of handling damage by getting a, a lot of the latency requirements in the window manager to go away because all of a sudden the screen could always look decent. You didn't have to draw things so rapidly. I learned that the perception of performance is largely a perception of lag between one correct image, uh, an incorrect image and a correct image. And if you look at the Mac OS 10 environment, that entire environment was drawn in software for years. 
until like the last year or so at Stanford. All of the applications were drawn, everything in software. And yet people said, it's plenty fast. The reason it looked plenty fast is because the screen never, you could never watch it draw. And so by getting rid of this whole visible drawing on the screen, you can go remarkably slowly and still have a, a perception of good performance. I mean, look at this. I'm doing put image for every scan line here, right? This is like 100 times slower than moving windows around with X, where it's fully accelerated using all the hardware. And yet, the performance perception here is fine. You know, if I had X this fast, I'd be happy. <laughs> Uh, let's go find out. I, I haven't looked at the size in a while. Yeah, of course. It's an MIT license. It's in my CBS. Would I come to this conference and show you closed source software? Closed source is typically available. Or open source is typically available. I don't know if it's available. Oh, that's in my CBS on my machine. Of course. Harsh. What? Well, there's no applications. <laughs> Is there any extra? No. It's just an extra. And a calculator. It has more than X when they ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, has more use, it has more useful applications than XOR does today. <laughs> you, you like this clock? Yeah. Yeah, I worked on that for a while. I spent what? way too That's much time. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is, is this actually clock number three? Um, the first clock I did was O'Clock. How many of you have ever run O'Clock? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I stole that from Sun. <laughs> the second one I did was FD Clock. How many of you have seen FD Clock? Yeah. That was the second one. This is, the, this is iteration number three. Am I getting better at clock design? <laughs> or is it, you know, have I kind of peaked and going back downhill? <laughs> yeah. So you can see these are all the object files. In total, it's like uh, 70 kilobytes or something. You'll note that one of them is huge. Uh, this is a, uh, oh, come on, Jesus, no terminal. This is all of the possible rendering operations expanded. It just does every possible operation. So you've got arbitrary source, arbitrary destination, arbitrary operation. It's just, it's the combinatorial explosion. It's what I can't do in render, and it's why render is so slow on your screen. I can't do this combinatorial explosion. Each axis is too long, and there are uh, several more axes. Yeah. So you them right oh, I've actually thought about doing that. I looked at a couple of uh, compile on the fly systems where you, where you generate microcode, you generate kind of uh, high level assembly code, and then it's and, and compiled out on the fly to a machine with a machine specific compiler. I looked at that. None of them are really tractable at this point. Um, and the other thing is, of course, in the X environment, <laughs> hardware does it all in a pipeline really fast. So, but yeah, I looked at that, and uh, the systems look, don't look tractable. You have to do a bunch of caching work, and there's also, most of the good ones have some interesting licensing issues. So I, it would be nice to be able to do. I think there's a more tractable um, uh, path in X to using uh, a patch-based system where you actually uh, each operation operates on fixed data types and you do conversions to the boundary of the system. I think it's more tractable. Question? Uh, what do you need from the hardware? Do you need like VGA or something? I need a frame buffer. That's all I want. And in fact, it doesn't have to be a linearly accessed frame buffer. In the device we're building, the frame, the, the, uh, frame buffer is actually something you poke bytes at over basically a serial line. And you say, here's where I'm starting to write the frame buffer. Right, 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 right. I'm done now. And so I need very thin access. So even, a, even an old VGA display in uh, page mode works just fine. It's 16 bit color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, you could do it with grayscale. That's just that this particular instantiate, you could convert it all to do only grayscale, for instance. That would be relatively straightforward. You wouldn't have to change the APIs at all. You just change the, only, the available image format. So the only thing it saved was gray and do color, uh, color to uh, gray conversion in all the API points. Any uh, questions? Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One more question? Um, could you write uh, a uh, X nest that ran on top of this? <laughs> no. 
Uh, this doesn't provide any of the core X rendering operations at all. And the only text that it provides is this lame little part. You can emulate all that stuff, but what would be the point? Or it says it's running on another machine and displaying this in your little Yeah, thing. yeah. Well, it certainly could do a VNC client. I think that'd be a more, a more interesting more interesting. Terminal replacement? External. Oh, a replacement for external? No, unfortunately, I'm using GNOME kernel these days, which is kind of sad. Uh, GNOME kernel has a tremendous advantage of merging multiple fonts together so that when you display things that aren't in uh, Isolat 1, I actually get them on the screen instead of little square boxes. That was the only reason I switched. I wanted to be able to display quote marks correctly. <laughs> I think we're done here today. Thanks for coming. Have a good time.